Hello, and welcome back to The Painted Mini. My name is Travis, I'm your host, and today I'm excited because today we get to talk about the dragon in Trudvong Legends. Uh, and to me, the dragon is just a quintessential creature of mythology, so this will be good. I didn't want to pull a bunch of random things from random places, though, so I'm going to focus in today uh, on the words of one of my favorite authors, Jorge Luis Borges, who wrote a book in the late 50s, early 60s, titled The Book of Imaginary Beings. And I'm gonna let him speak to you uh, on the importance of the dragon. Afterwards, we'll go ahead and paint the dragon, and today we're gonna be using a lot of airbrush. So I'm gonna take a second and sort of go over my airbrush setup, uh, some of the basic gear. If there's anyone out there looking to get an airbrush, uh, wanting to get started, Hopefully I can help you out and save you a few dollars. So without further ado, let's get started. We are ignorant of the meaning of the dragon in the same way that we are ignorant of the meaning of the universe. But there is something in the dragon's image that fits man's imagination. And this accounts for the dragon's appearance in different places and periods. The Chinese dragon, the Lung, is one of the four magic animals. The others are the unicorn, the phoenix, and the tortoise. At best, the western dragon spreads terror. At worst, it is a figure of fun. The lung of Chinese myth, however, is divine and is like an angel that is also a lion. We read in the historical record of Su Ma Xian that Confucius went to consult the archivist or librarian Lao Tzu, and after his visit said, birds fly, fish swim, animals run. The running animal can be caught in a trap, the swimmer in a net, and the flyer by an arrow. But there is the dragon. I don't know how it rides on the wind or how it reaches the heavens. Today I met Lao Tzu, and I can say that I have seen the dragon. In the I Ching or Book of Changes, the dragon signifies wisdom. For centuries it was the imperial emblem. The emperor's throne was called the dragon throne his face, the dragon face. In about the 6th century, Zheng Xiangyu executed a wall painting that depicted four dragons. Viewers complained that he had left out their eyes. Annoyed, Cheng picked up his brushes again and completed two of the twisted figures. Then, the air was filled with thunder and lightning. The wall cracked and dragons ascended to heaven. But the other two eyeless dragons remained in place. And a little closer to our Trudvong version of the dragon, we have the Western Dragon, and Voorhees states, In Pliny there is also a chapter devoted to remedies derived from the dragon. Here we read that its eyes, dried and stirred with honey, make a liniment that is effective against nightmares. The fat of the dragon's heart stored in the hide of a gazelle and tied to the arm with the sinews of a stag assures success in litigation. Dragon teeth, also bound to the body, ensure the indulgence of masters and the mercy of kings. With some skepticism, Pliny cites a preparation that even renders men invincible. In the 11th book of the Iliad, we read that there was a blue three-headed dragon on Agamemnon's shield. Centuries later, Norse pirates painted dragons on their shields and carved dragon heads on the prowls of their longships. Among the Romans, the dragon was the insignia of the cohort as the eagle was of the legion. This is the origin of present-day dragoons. In the West, the dragon was always thought of as evil, one of the stock exploits of heroes, Hercules, Sigurd, St. Michael, St. George, was to overcome and slay a dragon. In Germanic myth, the dragon kept watch over precious objects. And so in Beowulf, written in England in the 7th or 8th century, there is a dragon that stands guard over a treasure for some 300 years. A runaway slave hides in its lair and steals a cup. On waking, the dragon notices the theft and resolves to kill the thief. The dragon begins to ravage the kingdom. Beowulf searches it out, grapples with it, and kills it, dying himself soon after from a mortal wound inflicted by the dragon's tusks. All right, let's take a second. I want to show you my airbrush setup. This is my paint booth. Um, these run about 100 bucks to 150 bucks. The one I have is actually double wide, so it's a little wider than most. It gives me a little bit more room. Uh, and it's got two big features that I like. One is the light. You can see it's got LED lighting uh, on the top and sides here. It gives it a pretty good light area. 
Uh, and then it's also got a dual exhaust fan system, or I'm sorry, a dual fan that has a single exhaust, uh, and that I've got it porting out of my building here using just like a dryer vent on the outside. So let me show you real quick. It has the option of just putting one fan on, putting both fans on, not much difference. And then this just controls the light. And this is my air compressor. And it's really the air compressor is right here. And then this is just an auxiliary tank that's connected to it. And it, it came this way. So I do encourage you, if you can afford spending a little bit more, to go ahead and get one with a tank on it. Because then your compressor is not running all the time. Uh, it'll actually build up the pressure it needs and then cut itself off and cut back on when it needs to. Um, it's better for the engine, the pump itself, uh, and it reduces noise overall. And this one's not actually that loud. I'll turn it on. So that's as loud as it gets. Not too bad. Uh, a couple of little features here to look for. One is you definitely want an air pressure gauge. This one also has, it's adjustable, so this is a dial that you can use to control the air pressure. And it also has a lock, so you can lock it down, and it'll stay where you want it. Um, it's got a couple of little spots. You can hold two airbrushes here. And this down here is an air trap, or I'm sorry, a moisture trap, so it just captures moisture from the hose system uh, and stores it so that's kind of nice. Uh, keep some of the moisture out of your miniatures. So this is my airbrush. This is a Neo Awada. Uh, Awada is a middle of the line brand. It's pretty solid. It's good for beginners, I think. And the Neo is their sort of starter line, I guess. And it is a dual action top feed. So your paint just goes into the bowl there directly in and then dual action means that you push down the button to actually release air but you then have to pull the trigger back to release paint so it's sort of a combination of pushing down and pulling back and you just have to sort of play with it and get the feel for it it's got a good trigger feels good so a couple of things you might want to pick up if you're getting in an airbrush cleaning kit you can usually find these three items sold together and this is just for when you do need to really get in and clean things uh, out. Okay, this is just a needle with a flat edge on it. And it's really useful just for really cleaning, uh, cleaning the airbrush, getting dry paint freed up from sticky spots. Uh, and also I use this quite a bit for just getting those dried crusted clogs out of my uh, paint, paint bottles. All right, couple of things. These are, I've always called them uh, tattoo bottles. Uh, tattoo artists use these, I know, but I've also recently seen these at Lowe's in the plant section and they labeled it as a succulent watering bottle. So, Go look in your hardware store. You can probably find these. Otherwise, you can order them from Amazon. But one, I just have water, and I do put about one-fifth to one-sixth of Liquitex Flow Improver in the water. Uh, and this one says ABC, and that is my airbrush cleaner, which you can buy airbrush cleaner if you want, or uh, just mix maybe one-fifth Windex or one-quarter Windex to water and it works just fine. The other thing you'll want to pick up is some kind of lubricant um, for the needle and the airbrush. This just keeps it from drying out quite as fast and keeps everything smooth, super cheap. Um, so that's pretty much all you need to get started. And I'll go over some of the mixing tips and things as I paint. But if you have any questions, please email me, travis at thepaintedmini.com and I'll be happy to help you. I'll show you one more thing over here on the side. You've probably seen in the videos, but um, this is a little Vortex mixer. And it's just for 
mixing your paint works really well. Uh, maybe $30, $40. Um, it's super simple. And once you have it, you don't want to get rid of it. It's one of those things. You didn't know you needed it until you used it. Uh, that's pretty much it. So let's go on and take a look at our dragon. And that brings us to True Vong Legends and our logo worm. So first off, I really like what they did in the Kickstarter with their professional paint job. So I just went ahead and pulled up my phone and found the Kickstarter image to use as a reference. I'm using a blood red bead paint and just shoot it directly on for that nice base red color. Now my uh, airbrush is an Iwata Neo, which is sort of a, uh, maybe a next step up from super cheap beginner, maybe a middle beginner airbrush, but it's been pretty good to me. It's pretty simple. It uh, feels good. So I've stuck with it. And here I'm just coating everything. Just hitting part of the wings. We'll see why in a bit. I'm gonna sort of layer those out. And of course the bottom of the dragon I'll do with another color. And there she is, skeleton bone, a little touch of black just to darken it up a bit. And you'll see I just use a designated brush for stirring and mixing in the airbrush bowl. And there I'm just shooting his butt, a little bit of that skeleton. So I take a red and I'm just sort of filling in a little bit, kind of a bright, solid red. Some areas that are a little spotty. Trying to, trying to be a little careful as get closer to that area that I painted with the skeleton color. But mainly just touching up here, brightening up. So now I'm going to wash out my bowl. Take a look here. And now I'm going to come in with that darker red. It's a little bit of black. It's essentially a very dark red. And I'm going to do a stripe down the center of the spine. And that's about a 50-50 of black and red, but it sort of comes out darker. Creating a dorsal, dorsal ridge, a dorsal line. Okay, here I'm going to take some vampiric skin, so that skeleton, and I'm trying to look at where the actual cells fall, and I was going to kind of go through and try to keep my paint within those separate little scale cells and just sort of pick out a path where pigmentation would hit one and then the very next cell would be red. I didn't want an arbitrary line of color that crossed through specific cells. So a cell or a scale uh, is either gonna be red or white, essentially. Now one of the problems I have here is I didn't quite let my red layer dry and it keeps seeping through a little bit. That lighter color should have waited a little longer to make sure that red was completely dry. So I did have to kind of go through and do a few layers of the white. So 
Still kind of deciding as I paint where this border is going to be uh, between the two colors. So you can see I kind of raised it up a little higher, included part of that. It looks like the jaw. And then this sculptor loves mangled teeth. This is the same sculptor as the garm, I imagine, but you have to really get in and look at what these teeth are trying to do because they are all over each other. And again, I'm just really having to go over this a bit because that red is bleeding through a little bit when I first apply that white. You can see after I did the spine on the dragon, I also used that dark color to kind of hit the wings. Sort of create that gradation between that dark at the top, red in the middle, and sort of that light white at the bottom. Okay, now I'm going to start working on the spines a little bit. And this is probably the part that gave me the most trouble. It's just a hard cylindrical shape to get a good smooth transition from. So I think I tried a few different things and none of them really worked great. That's kind of a tough area. Normally you can just do like a wet brush or something, but just a cylindrical spike is a little tough for that. But I wanted the white to be the bottom and then as it grew and aged, it would darken. So that the tips will end up being black. Get a good shot of the wing here. There are a lot of little spikes on this. If you look at the wings, it's each of those ribs ends in a spike. And then you also have some little spikes that pop out sort of halfway down the wing in spots. The wing tips are spikes. I kind of blacken the snout here a little bit, a little bit more character. And then I end up after I do the, I do the whole base, I do the tip, and then I kind of go in and do the little in between where the tip transitions into the Skeleton white. And that water that I use to thin my paints is about one fifth flow improver. So this is the in between, it's thinned down so that I'm kind of hitting right where the white meets the black and creating a third color is a little bit of a dark red. Kind of a red brown. That is mostly just the wash at this point.
Here I'm just working that wash into some of the cracks and crevices of the skin. Now I'm going to tackle the teeth here, nothing crazy, just more of that white color. I think I've added a little bit more pure white to the skeleton just so it's not the exact same as the skin tone. Give these gnarly, gnarly teeth. Just kind of working some little pattern and color around the eye just so it kind of gives it a little more character. Trying to do it the same thing on the other side symmetrically. And here I am taking a essentially a contrast paint and watering it down to make a wash out of it. And I'm just sort of using that both to get the teeth and then here I'm taking a contrast red and I'm going in and I'm creating a transition between that dark black stripe and that bright red body. So I'm just kind of doing another transitional stripe between the black and the bright red and creating a sort of a darker red contrast. And that's just gonna give it a smoother transition. I do that on both sides of the mini. And it definitely gives it a better gradation Here I'm just going in with a bright yellow, going to do a base color for the eye. Stick with those warm fire colors. No. 